Hi guys, welcome back to Pointy Not Sharp. Today I thought I'd take the opportunity to go through valuations. Now, I've got a million messages for uh, people asking, you know, how much is this worth? What should I buy, uh, pay for one? Uh, same with the comments on my videos. It's just something that pops up nearly every day on this channel, honestly. And I've never addressed it before. So I thought I'd go through it. I've got a bit of a check sheet um, that I use when I'm trying to assign value. And this is really aimed at like the more obscure stuff, maybe with a Providence or stuff that doesn't pop up very often and there's no comparable sales. When you get something common like an M7, this is very easy. Just jump online. There's a million for sale. What are they all going for? That's generally what it's going to be worth. That's reasonably simple. But uh, it is... Um, your responsibility to your due diligence as well. You can't really pass that off onto anyone else unless that person is some kind of, you know, uh, they hold some kind of accreditation as an appraiser of um, antiques or military or something like that. It was just some random person. I probably wouldn't listen to them because there's just so many factors that can go into appraising or valuing something. So the first thing I've uh, decided to put down is research. You really, really need to research what you have. And um, the three bayonets I have here are just fantastic examples of that. So we'll go through this one here first. So it's an MLE 1892 Bertier, and it looks like the third pattern goods wood grip and shortened quillen, as well as the extended muzzle ring. Nothing too fancy here. You wouldn't expect to see one of these go for too much money. I mean, it does have a frog, and that's quite nice, and that'll add a little bit of extra value, but, you know, not too much. However, when you research it and you start looking a lot uh, closer, you'll notice this one has a marking on the spine, which means it's one of the incredibly rare first pattern ones. And of those first pattern ones, only the first couple... I don't know what number, very, very small numbers, have the markings on the spine with the manufacturer and data manufacturer. So instantly, this one jumps up in value just from that alone. And then this one here also has a bit of provenance. You turn it over and we have markings for and dates for Dunkirk. Uh, while I don't have uh, independent facts to verify it, it's certainly plausible. So that's where research can really add value to what you have. But then when you have something basic like just an M7, no additional markings, no scabbard, there's not too much you can add to that other than, you know, it's got a rack number, which may even detract from the price. Some people might like, might like it, some people might not. Now, when you're doing your research, as I previously said, check um, prices for, you know, past sales on uh, eBay. You can do that. Go into the settings and look at um, previous sales, type in what you want and see what you can find and make sure that they're reasonably current. And auction houses too, when you see uh, auctions, check what everything sells for and that'll give you a rough idea of current market value. Now, the second point I thought I'd harp on is condition. So, I've got an older bayonet here, I've got a uh, Turkish model of 1890. And as you can see, we've got a little bit of black uh, spotting and pitting along the blade. So when you're thinking about condition, you want to compare it to the other bayonets in its class. That's pretty typical for the bayonet of this this type here. You see that a fair bit. But things you want to consider like, you know, corrosion, rust, damage, missing components, like, you know, missing scabbard, missing frog, missing grips, missing push button, um, and anything else like that, those all can affect uh, value. And on top of that, does it have matching numbers? So like your German bayonets, your Zeitengewehr 8498s, um, if these don't have matching numbers, they drop in value. Or alternatively, if they do have matching numbers, they jump in value. So there's all kinds of little things to consider with condition, and that's really part of your research as well. The third thing I like to consider is the market. So the first thing to consider with the market is what country are you in? Because every country seems to have different values for bayonets. Like the US, they're relatively cheap. And then places like uh, Europe and Australia, they absolutely skyrocket. Uh, particularly down here in Australia, they are far more expensive. So when you're looking at um, buying bayonets, usually 
it's the cost of the bayonet in the US plus international shipping to get it to Australia. So while an M7 in the States might be like 50 bucks, you're looking at you know 110 uh, when you add international shipping on top of that. Then you've also got to look at um, how many people are actually interested in buying what you have. So if you have something really obscure and there might only be one or two people out there looking for one, you've got a very, very small market. It's not very uh, competitive. But if you've got something like uh, the Turkish model 1890 here, there's not many of these with the full length blades and they're quite sought after and there's quite a few people who want them. And uh, because of that, there's very high demand. So uh, it gets a bit more competitive and price definitely goes up. Uh, on top of that, there's also like um, special events to take into consideration as well. So I bought this one last year. I've already done a video on one. I'm not looking at keeping this one. I'm going to sell it, but um, I'm waiting to sell it because I'm waiting for the right time. So here in Australia, on the 25th of April every year, we celebrate Anzac Day, which is uh, kind of like a Remembrance Day. And um, every year around Anzac Day, the price of uh, particularly historically relevant to Australia bayonets jumps up in value very, very briefly for a couple of weeks and then sort of settles back down. And I took advantage of that last year. I did pretty well. I sold a Patton 1907 like this one. I bought for 200 bucks and I sold it for 350. I made 150 bucks just because of the uh, the time of year. So I plan to do something similar with this one. And as I previously stated, provenance is something that you do have to take into consideration or you have to research. So if there's any historical information uh, or evidence associated with a particular bayonet, so something like this one here, we know that because it's full length, it wasn't in Turkey in the 1930s, so it was likely captured before then. So it's a little bit of provenance there as well. We know that it was likely a battlefield pickup. And this one here has the interesting Dunkirk markings on the back. Now, we can't independently verify that um, without any kind of um, certificate or documentation. We have to take it with a grain of salt. You're only buying the bayonet. You don't buy a story if you can't verify a story. But um, I've got a friend who bought one of these as a Gallipoli uh, Battlefield pickup. And nearly every single one of these that sells has that claim. And honestly, it's probably true because that's generally the only place these tended to come from. However, this particular one had uh, documentation from the soldier who picked it up, uh, bringing it into Australia and declaring it, as well as his name, the medals and everything that was associated with that soldier. And it was pretty compelling, so pretty good provenance. And that definitely increased the value of my mate's uh, Model 1890. So anytime you have a bayonet associated with um, a significant event or anything historically uh, interesting, it's gonna increase in value. And uh, finally, the last thing I'd really like to harp on about is consulting experts. So you can get professional appraisals, but I recommend only from certified uh, antique appraisers who specialize in military antiques. There's not many of them around, and for garden variety bayonets like this, I wouldn't worry about it too much when they're only a couple hundred bucks, because you're likely going to have to pay a fee to get an appraisal like that. Uh, this is more aimed at your really, really high-end, super rare, like one-of-one one kind of stuff, like your you know 1860s uh, <laughs> Prussian sawback machete bayonets, all those crazy things that go for like you know five to ten thousand dollars. Uh, that's where you really want to get some kind of uh, expert opinion uh, where they can assign value, rarity, uh, historical significance, and uh, maybe even current market demand. That's something you're probably not going to be able to work out yourself, and it's probably going to be worth your while doing it in that situation. Keep in mind, guys, uh, value can fluctuate, and it's absolutely based on market trend and collector interest. So collector interest is um, something that does sort of bounce around a little bit. You know, movies come out or historical documentaries or more information, a new book, um, maybe even rifles coming out of Ethiopia and all of a sudden we have uh, either more or less bayonets or more interest in a bayonet, they might um, increase in value. So it's always um, fun to watch and see what's going on. Anyway, guys, that's all I've got for you today. Um, if you feel I've missed anything, please comment below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, valuing bayonets. Thanks for watching.